The Lord be with you. I'm starting to wonder if we need like air traffic control down in the front as the choir came down. <laughs> you know, go this way. And, uh, I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to Acts chapter 16. So we continue, as Sharonda uh, put it, which I should have known when Sharonda said she would. I was like, wait, I should have had a box of tissues. I should know. But thank you, Sharonda, for, uh, for speaking from, from your heart this morning. But we're going to continue to ask those questions. What if? And today we're going to ask ourselves, what if we dared to follow our dreams? And we'll gather our thoughts around Acts chapter 16, verses 6 through 15 there. They went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. When they had come opposite Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision. There stood a man of Macedonia pleading with him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision, he immediately tried to cross over to Macedonia, being convinced that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. We set sail from Troas and took a straight course to Samothrace the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city for some days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the gate by the river, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had gathered there. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city of Theatira and a dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. When she and her household were baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home. And she prevailed upon us. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O God, may you give us ears to hear. Ears that hear your words and not mine. Words that shape us. Words that challenge us. Words that call us to be more and more like your son Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. What if we dared to follow our dreams? Dreams can be weird, right? I mean, we've all probably had weird... I know mine. Mine can be weird sometimes. Like, I've had dreams where, like, I was a kid, like a really little kid again, playing in Grandma's backyard with somebody like Luke Skywalker. And I knew it was Luke Skywalker and not Mark Hamill, right? It's not the actor. It's actually Luke Skywalker. And then like three seconds later, I'm standing in the self-checkout line at Walmart with like a loaf of Italian bread and fish food. And somehow, in my dream, this all makes sense, right? It all kind of connects together. I'm sure some psychoanalyst would have a field day with that kind of dream. But there is one dream I have over and over. It's a recurring dream. Uh, I'm back in college. Somehow I have forgotten that I have a class, and I've missed it like all semester, and it's finals week. And and if I can just get to that class, if I can just get there and take the test and ace it, I'll at least pass. But then I don't know where it is, and time runs out. And when I wake up, I really feel like I've failed. And my whole life is gone and wasted. I've thought about like posting my diplomas over my bed so that when I wake up, I can be like, okay, it was just a dream. But dreams can be weird. But they can also be powerful. They can be powerful as they show us something just beyond our present situation. Something just over the horizon. They call us into the mystery of the future. They call us into the mystery of life because sometimes we wake up scratching our heads going, what in the world was that? And they coax us out of our comfort and into something more. That's how I think about Paul's dream in Acts chapter 16. 
If you have one of those little maps in your Bibles, you'll notice this is what we call Paul's second missionary journey. And he and his company have tried to go north by northeast. They want to go to Turkey and to Asia. But the Bible says they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. So they change route a little bit and try to go straight north to a place called Bithynia. Which, by the way, aren't you glad we don't have these kinds of city names in Alabama? I'm thankful for places like, like uh, Ohatchee instead of Bithynia. But they tried to go there, and the Bible says the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So they kept getting pushed over, and they wind up in Troas, which is way over... I'm actually looking at the map of my head is why I'm pointing this way. It's really this way for you. Um, they wind up in Troas, way farther west, on the coast of the Aegean Sea, across a little strait from the region of Macedonia, from the continent of Europe. And it's here where Paul, after wanting to go one way, is forced to go another, and he has a dream. While he's in Troas, Paul has this dream about a man in Macedonia, that region across the sea in Europe, where the good news of Christ has yet to be proclaimed. Now, I suppose Paul could have woken up from that dream and nudged Luke, who was there with him. Luke is writing here in first person. Tradition says this is Luke, and tradition tells us that Luke is Paul's physician. So Paul could have woke up, nudged Luke, said, Doc, Doc, do, do you got some Tums? I'm having weird dreams. Do you got some man? Something I ate last night must be messing with me, Doc. He could have brushed the whole thing off as just some dream triggered by the sight of a road sign in Troas, Macedonia, this way. You know, they say that happens sometimes. Your dreams are triggered by something you see during the day, one of the last things perhaps you see before you go to bed. So Paul could have said that, brushed it off, and doubled down and said, no, we're going east. I'm tired of wasting time in Troas. Let's go east to Asia. But of all the things Paul did, of all the things Paul could have done in reaction to such a dream, the very thing he did was actually pursue it. He pursued the dream of the man in need over in Macedonia. Now what's interesting to me is that Paul's pursuit of this dream doesn't really go exactly the way it ought to go, at least how I think it ought to go. I mean, Paul sets sail out of Troas. He sails to a place called Samothrace, stays there for at least a day, and then carries on to a place called Neapolis, and then finally, finally on to Philippi. It's taken him a few days. Philippi is a leading city of Macedonia, a Roman colony. Really the last place a Jew carrying the good news of another Jew would wind up. But here he is. Paul has made his way into Macedonia. So I would expect now that Paul has gotten there, he's had this dream, he's in Macedonia, that the need would become apparent quickly. That the man in his dream would meet him somewhere and go, the Lord told me that you had a dream about me. But it doesn't happen. You would expect Paul would say, okay, we're in Macedonia, let's set up shop boys, bring out the soapbox, let's stand here on the corner and get to preaching. But he doesn't do that. Instead, Paul and his crew just sort of hang out for, Luke says, some days. In fact, they're in Philippi long enough that the Sabbath comes around. And since there's likely no synagogue in a Roman colony, there was this sort of agreed upon normal among the Jewish folks in, in the ancient world. If there's no synagogue, go find a body of water. And so they go outside of the city to a river to find a place to pray. And it's there by the river, outside the city, away from where all the action's happening, that Paul finds an attentive audience. It's by the river, outside of Philippi, that Roman colony, where Paul's dream about a Macedonian man comes to fruition in the form of a woman. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, so she's a Gentile who believes and worships the Jewish God, from the city of Theatira, a dealer in purple cloth or dye. She's, she's a wealthy woman, a strong woman. And Lydia listens to Paul, baptized most likely in that river. Her entire household baptized likely in that river. And afterwards, she invites Paul and his folks to stay with her in her house. 
Now, if you read the rest of chapter 16, it's kind of interesting. Paul, is, keeps, go, Paul keeps going back to that river to pray. And one day as he goes, this, this fortune-telling girl starts shouting at him. And Paul sort of exercises a demon from her. And then her parents arrest him because, well, that's how they made money, right? Selling tickets for their, their little fortune-telling daughter. And so Paul gets locked up in prison. And then they find out, oh, wait, he's not just a Jew. He's a Roman citizen. we got to let him out. And so when Paul is let free from prison, we're told he returns back to Lydia's house before carrying on. This isn't really how I would imagine this dream would go. I, but you know, that, that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that the dream wasn't worth pursuing. Or that the dream, that the dream didn't come together and that it wasn't fulfilled. After all, imagine if Paul had not pursued the dream. If Paul had just brushed it off and stubbornly pursued his eastward-moving ministry, if Paul had ignored that dream of the Macedonian call, a group of women would have gone down to a river outside of Philippi, had worshipped God there, spent some time in prayer, and then just went home, unchanged. Nothing would have happened. Lydia would have gone back to selling her purple stuff, her purple clothes, her purple dye, her household would be unchanged. And the gospel, most likely, would have never left the ancient Near East. The good news of Christ would have remained hemmed up by the lapping tide of the Aegean and Mediterranean seas, waiting for someone else to carry the good news west. I mean, Lydia, I don't know if, it, if this is real clear, because we don't all have a real grasp, I think, of ancient Near Eastern geography. But Lydia is the first European convert. She is the first Western Christian. She likely helped to found and fund the congregation at Philippi, Paul's favorite church. So imagine if Paul had not followed his dream. If he had just stayed in Troas and just tried to go east, Again, what would have happened? I wonder what would have happened. I wonder what would have happened if Zebulun and Emmeline Williams, Samuel and Elizabeth Boozer, James Milton, Barbara Walden, Nathan and Nancy Roberts, Thomas and Mildred Johnston, I wonder what would have happened if that group of people hadn't followed their dreams. You see, it's those folks, those, that group of people who came together by Ohatchee Creek and had a dream about a church. About a dream about a church that would be a place to worship, a place of prayer. Where would we be if it wasn't for the dream of those charter members of this congregation? Some of us might be members of other churches. Some of us, heaven forbid, might be Methodists. If you are a Methodist, I'm sorry. It's a joke. I'm just kidding, right? You all, don't go tell your Methodist cousins and all. Our preacher hates Methodists. <laughs> that's not in the text. Well, some of us might be members of other churches, and that's fine. Some of us might not be church members at all. Some of us might not be Christian. And the truth is, some of us might not even be here at all. I mean, think about it. They could have just decided to leave well enough alone. It's 1850. They could have been content with some itinerant preacher just coming around every once in a while. Y'all want to have a prayer meeting? Great, let's go down by the creek. I'll preach, y'all take up an offering, and I'll leave. They could have been fine with that. They could have decided, you know, times, times are tough. There's rumbling about maybe some civil war around the corner. Let's not take the time and the financial and personal commitment to start a church. Let's not do this. They could have been fine with that. Some of them could have decided, you know, this place is pretty and all, but if there's not a church, there's no civilization. Let's move on down the road. Let's go to that place called Birmingham. Let's go down there. It's not worth settling in a place where there's no church. But they didn't. They pursued the dream they received from God. And Ohatchee Baptist number two, which anybody know what number one is? I still ain't figured that out. Anyway, Ohatchee Baptist number two was formed in 1850. And 167 years later, here we are. What would have happened if they didn't pursue the dream? 
I'm grateful to those first and faithful folks who dared to follow the dream they received from God. Imagine if in 1971, this congregation of folks, some of you still in this room, rather than following the dream of, of a new building, a brick sanctuary to replace the, the aged white frame structure that had stood here since 1924, had instead decided to ignore the dream. To brush off the dream as one grounded in the pursuit. Well, everybody else is getting a brick building. We don't need a brick building. Just because everybody else has one, we don't need one. What if? Where would you be this morning? Would we have boarded up the windows, strung caution tape across the door, posted a little red sign out on the clapboard, condemned, unsuitable for habitation? Would we be a handful of folks singing a cappella in a drafty old building wondering why nobody wants to come worship at the little white church on the corner of Pleasant Valley and Nisbet Lake Road? What if? What if we didn't follow our dreams? Imagine if saints like Dean Norton and Peggy Hamby hadn't pursued the call to serve as deacons in this church. Imagine if this church had decided that then that those women weren't called or capable to serve in such roles. That they couldn't preach, they couldn't teach, they couldn't be pastors, they couldn't be deacons because they were women. And every other Baptist church says that women can't do that. What if we had decided not to pursue that dream? What voices would be silenced? How many of our sisters would have given up hope in ever serving Christ in His church in the ways they believed God had called them? What if? Imagine if this congregation had not caught the vision. Any of you know that? You were here, maybe got the little yellow pamphlets, right? What if you had not caught the vision or pursued the dream in 1991? A vision of an expanded fellowship hall, a preschool center, new educational space, a kitchen. What a novel idea, a kitchen in a church. Imagine if we had just ignored the need to maintain and renovate an aging sanctuary. Where would we be? Many of you were dedicated as children in this room. Baptized before family and friends in this room. Married in the sight of God and others in this room. You've mourned the passing of your loved ones in this room. You shared meals, laughter, and special occasions in what used to be the fellowship hall, but it's now our daycare. What would those memories be like if we had not pursued the dream? Would you even have those memories? Imagine if we had not pursued the dream in 2005 of a Christian ministry center, a gymnasium, a commercial kitchen, new bathrooms with showers, a parlor and a senior suite, an expansive student suite upstairs and other updates and renovations throughout the building. Like Sharonda said, where would this community have gone in 2011 after storms and tornadoes ripped through it? What would they have done? Where would our kids have come together just a few months ago after the devastating news of a friend's death? Where would the hundreds, and I mean hundreds of children who have passed through our daycare, have found an affordable, safe place to receive care like they do on our campus? I could go on with these things, right? But I don't have to. Right now, you're thinking about it. You're thinking about times you've had in this room, in this building, in this space, happy times, sad times, times when you were grateful it was here, times when you just took for granted that it was here. What if we didn't follow the dream? Where would we be? As it was for Paul, pursuing the dream that God gives us isn't always easy. Sometimes it comes after we've tried our own way time after time, and it's failed every time. Sometimes it calls us in in an entirely different direction from the one that we would want for ourselves. We want to go this way, but God keeps pushing us this way. It often, if not most often, doesn't turn out exactly the way we think it should. And it can be a pursuit filled with frustrations, delays, complications, time when the energy is high, time when it seems to grind to a stop. But the pursuit of God's dream is always worth the effort. Paul was pursuing that dream. He, He could have said, no, it's a woman, not a man. Didn't go the way he wanted. But it's always worth pursuing. Sometimes you go, like Sharon said, I don't want to build a gym. 
And then you realize the dream of God is always worth pursuing. So I'm thankful that God pursued, or that Paul pursued God's dream to go to Macedonia, to take the gospel to Europe, for who knows what may have happened in the history of the church if he didn't. I'm thankful to those first faithful few who gathered by Ohatchee Creek and pursued God's dream of a church that would 167 years later be thriving and seeking the next step in that same dream. The church that would be sending funds all over the world, people all over the world to make a difference. I'm thankful for those who pursued God's dream to build this room, this house of worship, this sanctuary, a reality A place where we can come and worship the God who calls us to pursue the dreams that God gives us. I'm thankful that we're still pursuing the dreams we had. We first dreamed in 1991 and in 2005. I'm thankful that those dreams have not only led to this building and programs that have touched lives of so many in and around our community, but that they have led us to places like Korsan, Ukraine, where a church was built with $13,544 from this church in 1995. That's 1995 money. $13,000. Places like Port-au-Prince, Haiti, where 17 of us from this congregation went and served hungry babies, built furniture and made repairs to schools and helped people in the heart of that too often depressing city. That we've been to places like the Rio Grande Valley where we've partnered with people who are not just brothers and sisters who share the same faith as us. People who have become family to so many of us. Places like Perry County in Alabama, the poorest county in this state, where we've gone to sow seeds of hope in the lives of those who may otherwise have none. I'm thankful that we have pursued the dream of God so far all these years. So I ask you now, what if we dare to continue to follow the dreams God gives us? In spite of our perceived difficulties we may face, in spite of saying, well, it might be the most expensive thing, it might be the hardest thing, it might be the most time-consuming thing we ever do, what if we dare to follow God's dream further? What if we dare to follow our dreams further into the future, further than we can ever imagine? further into bringing about the reality of God's kingdom? What if we dare to follow our dreams that lead to God's kingdom coming on earth as it is in heaven? What if? Do you hear it? Do you hear it? The man calling. The man calling from Macedonia. Do you hear it? Will you respond? Will you go? Will you dare to follow the dream that God gives us? Let's pray. Holy God, Lord, we are thankful. Thankful for those, Lord, who dare to follow the dream you give them. God, we are thankful for the dreams you do give us. And we pray for the courage and the strength, the faith, Lord, to follow them. God, we are thankful for those who directly, uh, through the following of their dreams, have impacted us. Have given us so many great memories and have helped us to do so many great things. And Lord, now as we stand looking out toward the future, as you give us dreams, that we pray for the courage and your guidance to follow them. So Lord, be with us even now in this time when we reflect, when we listen for your Holy Spirit. Begin even now, Lord, to give us those dreams. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.